if we don't face up to these realities and make quick decisions, bold decisions now, we're setting ourselves up for more traumatic collapse. Some of the stories we're hearing in the environmental movement about we only have a certain number of years to stop catastrophe and therefore people don't talk about adaptation to catastrophe, I think that's unhelpful because I think we need to act now on the basis that a collapse of our agricultural systems is coming or is actually upon us already that will buy us more time for mitigation and a transformation of culture and values and so on. It doesn't mean we succeed and therefore we have to sit with that. We have to accept that we may not grow old. The strange joy of climate change is the invitation to look right now at questions that we sideline in our busyness to be uh, respected, loved even. It's, it's making us really think about what is, why are we alive and how do we wish to live and what's important to us. For episode 45, my guest is Jem Bendal, who is an academic professor who focuses on sustainability and leadership. He wrote a paper which has caused great stirs and ripples on the concept he has put forward called deep adaptation, which explores the science around climate breakdown and lays out what he sees as a complete collapse of all our systems, economic, political, societal, within the next 10 years. We discuss what this means and how we handle this as humans, as well as what it gives us permission to focus on, such as the things that are the most important to us. We share this with you as the last episode of this year, when we are in a time of both celebration and reflectiveness. It's not really a doom and gloom episode or concept, as it offers us an opportunity to focus in on what is most core to our being, to rise into our greatest and free ourselves from some of the trappings of our societal structures. I want to share that my intention of offering this conversation is not to alarm or cause fear, but to open this space of freedom. I feel it's important we don't attach too deeply to any notion of fear and projection. The world is always changing and nature is leading the way. So perhaps this is the collapse of some of the systems that aren't serving us, especially the economic basis of our global society. This is the natural cycle of death and rebirth. How can we detach from the system we have grown up in how can we let go of this system and allow something else to rise? As this is the last episode of the year, I want to ask you for your support if these conversations have been supportive and inspiring for you over this year. We are still only receiving a small amount of our core costs from our patrons, so if you can make a donation, we would very much appreciate this. Also, taking five minutes to write us a review on iTunes and to send the podcast link to your friends will really enable us to reach the people who need to listen to this show. We really appreciate each one of you and hearing from you really rocks our world. As Lucy, Mary and I work remotely, when we get messages and feedback, it really brings us together and connects us to why we do this. Let us know what has stood out for you in the episodes over this year. And if you haven't got it yet, please do download our wonderful ebook gift, which Lucy has made, which includes quotes from past episodes on different themes and reflection questions. You can get this from our website, www.thefutureisbeautiful.co and click on gift. I hope that you enjoy this conversation and I look forward to welcoming you into the next spin around the sun. Welcome to The Future is Beautiful, with me, your host, Amisha Gadiali. On this show, we explore the weave between politics, spirituality, creativity, and sustainability. It's time for us to move beyond silos and into an integrated way of being. Every one of us has ideas and personal experiences to share that can lead us to a brighter future. This is The Revolution. Despite the challenges we face as a global community or the pressures that we meet in our daily lives, when we stop and dare to dream, to ask ourselves the big questions and to share what we are already doing, we create the future that we wish to wake up for. That future is beautiful. 
Gem, it's so wonderful to see you and have you on the show and to be here in Bali. We've done our best to make the space quiet, but the beauty of Bali is that there are always, nature's always present. And so we can hear the birds and, and maybe some other things in the background, but it kind of adds to I think the reality of what we're talking about um, and being in the world. And I really enjoyed spending time with you yesterday at the Green School and being with these amazing 15-year-olds discussing your paper and your work, seeing the kind of questions that they have and the reactions that they were mm. holding. Can you share with us where this notion of deep adaptation came from in terms of your own research, but perhaps your own journey? Hmm. Yeah, I'm still very, uh, I'm still digesting what happened yesterday. It's only the third time I've spoken to a group of people since my report came out, my deep adaptation report came out in July this year. And I was worried because it's a very, it's a very difficult message I'm offering, which is the inevitability of climate induced societal collapse soon. And I guessed it within 10 years. And I, I think any prediction is, is, is just, is just a guess because we live in complex human systems. So it's not just trying to work out what's happening in the climate, um, but also then having guesses at how that will impact on food systems and then political systems and so on. But uh, I was impressed with how they were so immediately open to explore what does this mean for their lives and their choices. Uh, and seem to be very comfortable with sharing in front of each other, their classmates, um, about emotions uh, and confusion and how this sort of really does change everything in terms of what they're going to focus on, for what they're going to study, what they're going to aspire to. And really curious, they were curious. And that's quite different from the presentations I gave to adults. Uh, uh, where there's more grieving. There's much more grieving I experience when I present this to, to an adult audience. Um, and I still haven't quite processed why that, why that is. It might be because children have less to unlearn, have less invested in existing stories, and maybe less of a sense of responsibility for others. I'm not sure, but it was fascinating. So you've, I guess I've already said something about the work. Um, uh, how did I arrive at this conclusion and then offer sort of a framework which I've labeled deep adaptation? I became an environmentalist in 1988 when it was really high in the, the, the public eye in the UK. Um, was the, day, the year Chico Mendes was murdered, the Brazilian uh, trade union leader, uh, murdered because of his environmental activism. It was the year when the Green Party had their biggest ever election result in, I think, the European elections. So there was a real awakening in the UK at the time. And that coincided with me at, as a 15, 16 year old myself back then becoming uh, connected to more existential questions about why am I alive? And uh, at the time then, Christianity was, was the thing for me to look into. Uh, and so I decided back then that, I, I talked about it back then as the, the world would be my church and my work would be my worship, and that meant environmentalism. So since then, I was driven that was my purpose, uh, and it was a it was a purpose connected to uh, a, a concept of the transcendent, and it was an answer to this existential crisis. Like, well, what's the purpose of my life? My life's going to end one day. So, 
and I think I think teenagers around that age do become much more conscious of their own mortality. And so that was so that's and at university in my geography degree I studied climate science, and then I decided, ah, oh, okay, to do something about this, I can't. Um, be a climate scientist, that's pointless. I need to try and work on economics and politics and business and finance and so on. So then I went and worked in the sustainable business field for most of my career. I mean, I'm now a professor in that field. I was in senior management in WWF and we were doing a lot of corporate responsibility work for the last few years, seeing all this information about the latest trends in climate, the latest impacts on permafrost and, uh, and uh, ice cap uh, melting and so on, it meant that I had this suppressed panic because I knew these things I was seeing were the, were in front of my eyes, the very worst case predictions from when I was studying climate in 1993, mm -hmm. being taught by an oceanographer and looking at the, the, the ice cores pulled and, and all these so all the all the paleo climatology stuff, and so it was like a horror. It was like a horror movie unfolding between before my eyes, and I couldn't postpone it anymore. I had to t take time off and actually go back to the science myself to see. Well, I can't sit on the fence anymore. I have to look at it again for myself, and so I took time to then look at the various different papers and where there was a dispute about the situation of methane in the permafrost. I would then go and find out the latest from the research institutes and also the latest measurements of methane in the atmosphere. Through that process, I ended up realizing that um, we have many signs of already runaway climate change, meaning that we're not in control. So for example, the, the, the fires in California at the moment are contributing as much to America's carbon emissions as uh, all their energy consumption. Uh, this year, according to one study. It's just, oh. it's just yet another example of once the changing climate impacts on the biosphere, it then releases more carbon, but also uh, absorbs more energy. So with the albedo effect on the, on the bouncing off of the light coming into the Arctic, 95% of all light that comes in hits the ice and uh, the, the light goes back into space. Once, once that's melted, then 95% is absorbed into the Arctic Ocean, and therefore some scientists, top, top scientists, like Professor Peter Wadhams have said that means that if we lose the Arctic, that's, it's, it's equivalent to 50% of all the warming from people since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So if we've, we've got one point something already from our own activities, that immediately puts us over the, the tipping point. Mm -hmm. So I looked at all that and then I thought, I, my own truth based on this is that it's too late to con for us to control this. We are going to have increasingly disruptive and catastrophic effects on our own lives. Uh, and it's the, the key, key concern is the impact on, on agriculture. So my paper came out in July, but that was before all the uh, the latest data on what the 2018 Northern Hemisphere summer, I mean, it wasn't just in Britain or the Europe, it was across the whole of the Norm Northern Hemisphere. And so in most countries, they've experienced between 25 to 35% reduction in grain or vegetable uh, output. Mm -hmm. That's because we rely so much on rain-fed agriculture. So then, yeah, we, 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 that's just with one summer. So we, we my conclusion was... we. Uh, we will have some form of collapse, by which I meant a, a breakdown in the normal ways that we gain our sustenance, security, identity, entertainment, you know, the, the, the normal way of life that most of us experience. And of course, it's already happening for some people. And many people, when they hear this, say, well, I think breakdown's already begun. Um, and they point to poverty, mental health, or what's happening in across the global south, where lives are being ruined already. So with deep adaptation, I felt that people in my field, sustainable business, sustainable development policy fields, knew this deep down, 
but they were scared of accepting this because it would it would question everything about their career, their profession, the projects they were working on, their identity, who they are. Um, and therefore, they were scared that despair would set in and therefore depression, they wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. They were also scared about what accepting this might mean in terms of what do they tell, what do they tell other people? What do they tell the public? Many of the people working in this field are very focused on communicating publicly and thinking about how do we tell better messages. So there was a lot of, a lot of fear there, and I felt that was blocking uh, acceptance. And I also felt that unless we begin to accept where we're at, uh, we can't have generative conversations about what do we do now. And so I offered deep adaptation as, a, as an invitation for people in that kind of position to explore. Like, it, it doesn't mean it's the end of your work to accept collapse is inevitable. It, 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 not at all. There's just means there's going to be a new agenda. And then I, it's very simple. I just introduced three questions because I don't have answers. This is an entirely new field for me as much as it is for anyone else. So I offered uh, resilience, relinquishment and restoration. And basically resilience meaning asking ourselves, what is it we most value that we most want to keep uh, ahead of, during and beyond collapse? Relinquishment, what is it that we really must let go of? Because if we don't, we'll make matters worse. And restoration, uh, what is it that we've lost because of our industrial consumer civilization, our busyness, our assumptions of what progress is. What is it that we've lost that we need to bring back or, we, or that would be useful to bring back uh, to help us soften the collapse and find equanimity, peace, joy, kindness, creativity in the ahead of, during and beyond collapse. And I deliberately therefore framed deep adaptation as not as a sort of a progressivist thing. All those three R's are about, not about inventing something new. It's not about the new. It's about um, going deep inside into what we most value rather than just the stuff that we prioritize because of fear or busyness or status or what was expected of us from friends and family and employers, but delving deep into what we most value. Relinquishment is very much the, the letting go and restoration, the bringing back. So this wasn't a progressivist framing. It's we need to stop, stop thinking we can go forward in this and we need to rethink everything. So that was the offer. I thought when I published that paper, it was going to be a bit of an ending for me because I was sort of saying that my past work to some degree is redundant now. The paradigm is over and we need a new paradigm. And I did wonder what that would mean for my work and who I work with and my university job and so on. But what's happened is that surprisingly that, that report uh, exploded around the world and it appeared all over the world. And I had people from all corners of the globe writing to me uh, in all kinds of institutions I'd have NASA scientists or EU bureaucrats writing to me, but then I'd have a, a single mother with an 18-month-old 18 18 baby writing to me, saying she's crying while writing to me. Um, I, had, I had people who were religious leaders in America writing to me about the role of religion in the, the end times. I had people writing to me about they were joining movements to launch uh, direct action it was suddenly an explosion of connection and emotion, which put me into a bit of a spin, um, which I guess I'm still in. Hmm. Did you feel lonely with all this information in all these years that you've been looking at the research and then 
in actually putting together this paper? Did you feel like you were holding like a piece of information that wasn't reflected in the conversations or in the the daily life that you had? Yeah. The origin of this was I was asked to give a keynote speech a couple of years ago at an institute I helped set up in Australia 10 years ago. So it's 10th anniversary and I was asked to give a keynote and it was all about pulling together, we can do this, we can stop climate change. And I realized, and there were going to be hundreds of climate policy people in the audience. And I decided to do a very different talk where I said, in my world, this seems no longer true. So this was December 2016. And then I mentioned I was coming up with deep adaptation as a framing. I didn't realize at the time but what I was talking about was so certain or so soon. Mm-hmm. But the reaction I got from people in the coffee break after my talk was incredible. People were coming up and saying, thank you for being so brave. You're saying what I already feel, but I don't feel we have any permission to talk about uh, and recognize we're in each other, let alone spend professional time working out what does that mean we do? Or even what does that at least what does it mean we stop doing to create space to start thinking about what new to do? And that, that stayed with me. So it gave me a sense that people would welcome this and I could find powerful conversation and community if I was more open more often. And then there was a, uh, someone who got in touch to say he'd been using that speech to frame his grant making uh, in Britain it's funding community development initiatives, uh, exploring what relinquishment would mean for their community, uh, and funding artists to explore what these ideas meant. And when I heard that as well, that was further encouragement. And then at that, with that, after that conversation, I thought, okay, I can I can commune with people, I can connect with people on this topic. So then I knew that I was I needed to delve deeper. I needed to really look at the research, get my head rounds this and actually produce something more coherent and publish it and that's what I did and so yes there was there was loneliness um mm, it's interesting you ask that question because I used to fear being unemployed or unable to get contracts as a consultant because I thought I needed income to avoid being lonely. And that's because I only ever lived in expensive city environments, in uh, growth economies, consumer economies, rat race based mortgage, mortgaged lives where, oh shit, I can't afford a house type, or I can't afford the rent. So I kind of thought to have the lifestyle I want to be the person I can be and therefore not be lonely, I needed a career and I did need, needed money. And I think that was trapping me. That was holding me back from exploring the world uh, more fully and expressing my truth as I see it. So I think it was the fact I was here in Bali for six months and I discovered that I could be loved just as uh, just as one of a, a group that played together rather than as Professor Jem Bendel with career and 100 publications and uh, young global leader and former UN person and all that crap that I was just enjoying being in community with people here and learning together through conversation and play and dance and all manner of things. And that gave me a foundation to then talk publicly about this with less fear because I I didn't mind losing any of my old, old identity, old forms of income, all that. I didn't mind losing my profession. Mm. So yes, loneliness was a factor, but in in, in a slightly different way. Um, And... I've been impressed in the 
the power, the depth of connection I'm now experiencing through talking openly about this topic, because what I'm doing is talking openly about grief, loss, impermanence, panic, fear, trauma, and then also, and despair, uh, fear of depression, but I'm also talking quite openly about what else is true, or even what's the answer to all those things I've just listed, which is love, including compassion, connection, wonder at nature and at people, at our creativity as our resilience. My way of relating with people has changed incredibly this year, and my way of relating to myself has changed. I, I'm not denying who I am and trying to fit into a role that I've just chosen to tell myself is the better me or the more responsible me. So I'm more loving to myself as well. And has that freed up more space in yourself to, I guess, dive deeper into the work and into kind of understanding fully where we are? Um, it's still early days for me. I'm, I am still more days, some days more than others, at some deep level, petrified. And I'm still, when I tune into that, on the verge of tears. And I'm petrified on many levels, but one is the idea that what am I, what am I doing in terms of what am I putting myself forward to offer to others? You know, who am I to do any of that? I am someone who has not been open to the emotions and experiences of life to the extent other people, some other people have been by my age, 46. I, I almost like gave my life to my cause and I was very in my head. So I, I'm a novice when it comes to emotional awareness or grieving or tending to other people's grief and all that. I'm, I'm a complete novice in this. My answer is yes, by um, looking inward uh, and going deeper, I am feeling like I am, um, this is part of the work. This is part of, therefore, what I can help other people with. Uh, and that's becoming clearer to me recently as I persuade more people to work on this topic. Getting busy with action can be a distraction from full acceptance of our predicament, where our predicament is we don't know. We don't know what the best things to do are anymore, and we don't know whether whatever we do with the best intention will work. And that is not a reason for inaction. But the problem is, is when that uh, reality, if, if you can't deal with that because your own emotional equanimity is based on feeling like you know the world, and you know how things are, and therefore you have security in the basis of somehow having psychological and intellectual control of your surroundings and stuff. If you, if you have great difficulty in moving into that space of uncertainty and insecurity, then, then a lot of the ideas you're coming up with about what to do to, be, to develop local resilience or national level collapse readiness, it, I think it, it looks a bit manic. It's about trying to snatch security from a fundamentally insecure and unknowable situation. And then what happens is, is that 
we get all a bit combative. I can see people will get combative about my idea, my worldview, not yours. Mm. So my, I'm beginning to get a sense that my work in future could be around bringing back people to a sense of calm in the face of not knowing and that we can have curious, kind, joyful dialogue uh, where we don't need to prove ourselves right uh, in order to make ourselves less petrified. So, yeah, I'm. How, what does that mean I do? I'm not sure. I mean, <laughs> I'm having a conversation with you about it. I suppose that's doing something, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> kind of. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely doing something. Yeah. I feel like I want to just invite us and all of our friends listening to just take a few breaths <laughs> it's a lot what we're talking about mm -hmm. yeah me too Gem if you're listening to me now <laughs> and you're panicking about what you said last month to Amisha it's okay mate keep going <laughs> Yeah. It feels like what you're saying underneath is that it's about detaching to the ideals of this system that we've been brought up in. It's about beginning to really let go of all of the, the trappings of that system so that we can allow something else to arise. Yes, and I recognize, and it was good that you, you brought us back to this uh, sense of relationship with your listeners, because I realize what I'm saying is it's much easier for me to explore this than it is for many people. So many people have mortgages, family responsibilities, whether it's children or elderly parents, and a sense of responsibility to their organization. Um, so many organizations are doing good things, serving, in my case, you know, universities serving students or whatever. So there's that everyday busyness and, and, and decent meaning within that. So for me, or people like me, to come along and say these kinds of things is about, about as you've summarized well, which is about stopping, doing less, letting go, allowing despair with a faith that there's, uh, a, there'll be a new way forward after that, that will emerge for you in Hmm, I realize it's, it's much easier said than done. And uh, therefore, I guess the first message is be patient with yourself. I mean, I, I work on this stuff. And I first started thinking about this properly in November 2016. Uh, ahead of my speech, and then I just shared some ideas. And then it took me until January 2018 to actually properly start looking into this. And I'm a professor of sustainability leadership. This is central to my being. So, patience. Know that no one should change their whole lives on the basis of just hearing one person talk about these types of things. I mean, you need to look into it for yourself. Look at the analysis of people like me looking at the latest climate science and saying it's too late to stop a collapse of our society because of climate impacts on agriculture uh, and then knock on impacts on financial systems. You have to look at that and, 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 and integrate it to the extent that you believe it for yourself and then be patient about how you will change your life 
and uh, because otherwise this will just be disturbing and confusing and kind of just spoil your potentially just spoil your way of life now without in, uh, without bridging you into a new way mm. I've only really, I'm conscious that I am, as I said earlier, I'm a novice on this and I've only started talking publicly, uh, properly about this uh, since the report came out in July, like properly. And then, and, uh, and I'm learning as how people integrate this. Some people are just changing everything, dropping everything and joining the Extinction Rebellion. I know a few people who are becoming leaders within that. I know a few people who've done that since waking up to the idea of imminent collapse. Um, but other people will respond in other ways. It could be just that you stop stressing over your inbox and your angry boss, and you just go to work every day in a spirit of love and kindness, and you decide you won't work late, and you'll go home and you'll spend more time with your children, and, and you'll pick up the phone and talk to your lonely mother, um, rather than being so exhausted with work. You know, it, it can be simple stuff, yeah. a rebalancing. Patience, rebalancing, doing less attached to the current. It's basically, yeah, it's losing some respect for the current system. That will flow through in many ways. Yeah, I mean, it could be choosing to have less drama in your relationships, for example. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> um it's almost a, just an acknowledgement of life is short in a in a grand in a grander sense. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm having one of those moments where uh, I spent ages to say something which is obvious, and thank you for summarizing summarizing so well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, life is short. Less drama. Love everyone and love yourself. Yes. That's number one when you're uh, processing this kind of information, yes. Yeah, but I also feel like there is a lot of information that makes this all feel a bit more real. And a few of the examples that you shared yesterday, I feel like it would be useful. So for example, the way in which climate change is at the core of what's been happening in Syria. If you could share that as an example and also what's happening or what's going to happen around food. Because I think some of this stuff is still quite hard for mm. anyone to like comprehend that it's real. Sure. Just, I mean, you know, you go read a few reports, mm. but what does reading a report mean when you look around and everything seems the same? Mm -hmm. And when you watch the news and your politicians are talking about something else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's almost the same as when you, you read you know, a beautiful piece of spiritual work and, and you, you see a new reality and it doesn't feel reflected in, in, in everything around you, you know? And so I wondered if you could just drop us a little bit into how this is, very real and it is happening. Mm -hmm. So where are we at with the evidence for inevitable near-term societal collapse because of rapid climate change? So we could start with basics on, on the climate itself. The last four years were the hottest ever on record. So the way climate change will impact on human society and our very civilization uh, is through food and finance. So for example, uh, sea level rise, we will be devastating over a long duration, but um, we can deal with it. So it would disrupt, uh, it could disrupt ports and cities and some agricultural lands, but the pace of it is such which we, we, could, we could adjust. The f wildfires we're seeing, which are truly terrifying, again, to a degree, we, we, we can adjust. For me, where climate change it will 
it is already immediately impacting on human society is is through f food and soon through finance and so uh, we you mentioned syria uh, analyses of uh, uh, what happened in syria with the the breakdown of a very you know uh, it was i mean places like aleppo were world heritage sites with loads of tourists booming cultural centers and suddenly that, that country is ripped apart. Obviously, there's a political dimension to it and interference from various different uh, foreign uh, groups. But the, the key was a collapse in agriculture leading to rapid rural urban migration. So they had the worst drought for 800 years uh, just um, running up to 2011. Um, and this meant that, that you had a lot of people who had moved from their traditional livelihoods and jobs and family structures and cultural relationships suddenly then squatting in cities and with no income and with no sort of sense of belonging, that, that real disruption to their life. In such a situation, the government helped a bit, but also uh, community groups, foreign aid agencies, but significantly the mosques. And the mosques were also being funded by the Gulf states with a very much a radicalizing agenda. And there were many other reasons in terms of what was happening in Iraq, but it meant that um, the conditions all came together where you would then have a, a rise in, 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 in extremist uh, militarized groups. Uh, now that's not to say that the government was a good government uh, and it's not to say there isn't blame on all sides but the disruption to ways of life leading to mass urban migration leading to people being vulnerable and turning I mean what because what also is happening there could be happening elsewhere, which is that people no longer believe in the future. They no longer believe the idea that they just work hard and conform, uh, and then they'll have a good life or a good enough life, and their children will have a better life. When people stop feeling like that and there's desperation and confusion, then that's a context for, for either radicalization or even just allying with the strong man in, in power in government. It's not a very conducive context. Uh, compassion and well it, for some people it is and my hope is that we can respond with more compassion in such context but in the case of Syria unfortunately it then led to an awful civil war and that country I think collapse is a good description for what's happened there the concern is we only have four months of global grain har uh, reserves and so if we have about between 25 and 35 percent reduction in northern hemisphere grain production in 2018. Um, we only need that to happen in, for another couple of summers. And then we've got mass starvation, including in the West. So when I say that, OK, we, the FAO reports that we've got almost 900 people malnourished in the world today anyway, and that malnutrition is rising. And climate is one of the, well, climate is the main sy systemic uh, driver of growing hunger over the last three years already. But, you know, we ain't seen nothing yet if we have more summers like 2018. Uh, and also the El Nino effect, which is this Pacific current, which uh, typically uh, doesn't happen more than every five to seven years. It's finished in 2016, it's already coming back. It will kick in properly within the next 12 months. Uh, last time that, that produced droughts in East Asia, which therefore impacted significantly the production of rice in Vietnam, Thailand and elsewhere, to the extent that they then banned exports of rice. So if you can imagine, all we need is the El Nino to kick in properly in 2019, towards the end of 2019, and 2019 Northern Hemisphere summer and 2020 Northern Hemisphere summer to be like 2018, which uh, is not, um, it's, as, it's, it's not unlikely. You know, it, then, then we have a global food crisis, literally just within a few years. 
Uh, now, we could respond to that in a way which wouldn't lead to collapse. Mm -hmm. We could focus on, on the most important thing is keeping people fed and watered. Uh, when I say the most important thing, I mean more important than having a free market in food and restaurants and hotels and food processing and uh, supermarkets. And the thing is, we have such a combative political system in so many countries and a combative media that are we going to be clever enough to say, hmm, okay, we, we do need centrally planned food systems to avoid malnutrition and therefore civil unrest. It doesn't mean you can't go shopping for your TV or your next iPhone, but for food, we have to keep everyone fed. And therefore, it does mean that certain types of restaurants will close. It does mean that we would probably ban any grains being fed to cattle. Uh, and of course, in the current paradigm, we would obviously see people up in arms. You've just destroyed my industry. You've just destroyed, you know, you've just wiped off the share value of, of you know, my big investments, if you're you know, in the meat industry, for example. Mm. But we're going to, this is why it's going to be so difficult, because we are going to have to make dramatic decisions to uh, respond. Well, I mean, for example, right now, we should be having a massive investment, government led, in building greenhouses, irrigated greenhouses in Britain and across Northern Europe. It's because we need to have an insurance policy, a real one, against the potential collapse of rain-fed agriculture in next summer and the summer after. I mean, Spain has a lot hotter weather than Britain, but it produces more veg than Britain because it's all under plastic and it's all irrigated. Mm -hmm. um, now, that means there'll be need to be difficult decisions made, I presume, around planning laws and uh, water tables and rivers and so on. And so a typical environmental narrative would be, oh, no, that's going to damage biodiversity. That, that sounds like a techno-centric solution. That's not rewilding. That's not, not agroecology. Um, and no, it's not. But the thing is, if Britain or other countries fall apart because of a civil unrest, because people are, can't eat, then I don't think we're going to have much widespread support for, say, transforming industrial agric agriculture more generally and we rewilding things and cutting carbon emissions and uh, reforestation. I mean, if, if, if societies are in upheaval and people just want to focus on feeding their kids, I think a lot of these things will just fall away. So I think preparing for bold measures to adapt to disruption to our normal way of life is not a distraction from mitigation at all, as in reduction of CO2 or capturing more CO2 in, in the ecosystems. It's not an abandonment of the view that we can have a, uh, we can transition to a more beautiful, caring, post-consumerist way of life. Uh, not at all. I actually think if we don't face up to these realities and make quick decisions, bold decisions now, um, we're setting ourselves up for more traumatic collapse. So essentially, these are the last few years of being able to do all these things like reforestation and all of these sustainable initiatives in a place where we're kind of choosing to do them. And then if we miss that boat, which it feels like we are doing, given how high this stuff is on most government agendas and budgets, as in it's not... <laughs> that we're basically setting ourselves up for a situation where it's just all going to be very immediate around, yeah, what are we eating today? And it's going to be a lot of hungry yeah, citizens. I, 
I would return to what I said, uh, the, the issue of um, we don't know what will work. Mm. I've talked about emergency efforts to keep people fed and watered despite the possible collapse of rain-fed agriculture, like as, in, as if 2018 is the start of the collapse of rain-fed agriculture in the Northern Hemisphere. We, we should be doing that now because... We absolutely should be doing that now, and we should also be preparing for, okay, what happens if, if we have issues with food supply? How are we going to manage that in a market economy? It doesn't mean it will avoid a complete collapse of society. All I'm, what I'm saying is it would at least buy us time. It would mean at least we don't make matters worse through our inaction or our delusion. So I think some of the stories we're hearing in the environmental movement about we only have a certain number of years to stop catastrophe and therefore people don't talk about adaptation to catastrophe, I think that's unhelpful because I think we need to act now on the basis that a collapse of our agricultural systems is coming or is actually upon us already that will buy us more time for mitigation and a transformation of culture and values and so on. It doesn't mean we succeed. Mm. And therefore we have to sit with that. We have to accept that we may not grow old, that we may just be facing a future of, of grief and loss and insecurity. Um, yeah, I mean, we, so we need to act without certainty. So yes, these absolutely, I would say um, this is the last. Uh, hmm. No, I don't, I don't want to say that because no, even if, even if there's a massive greenhouse, irrigated greenhouse building program in three years time, um, and even if people start uh, doing marine, marine cloud brightening in the Arctic uh, in three years, say when, oh, there's no, there's no ice, sea ice in September, say in 2021. And then it's only at that point that people think, oh, let's brighten the clouds and try and bring the ice back. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not too late, mm. but we really should be doing all that now. Do I believe we will? Um, I do not believe we will sufficiently at scale in enough countries uh, for it not to lead to... Um, uh, civil unrest and breakdown in societies and therefore more refugees and yeah and a lot of un well a lot of destruction mm -hmm. so it's a heavy thing to live with yeah and we've uh, and as I talk about it now with you I think it raises the question of how do we um, live with if, if this becomes your own perspective as it has mine, how do you live with that? You know, it's all well and good me saying it intellectually that, oh, we need to act without certainty. So my response to the potential uh, siren call to action was, yeah, yeah, absolutely, but it probably won't work. Um, so <laughs> how do you live with that? It's an invitation to spiritual questions. It's an invitation to spiritual practice. Uh, it's an invitation to... Tune in to what you most love. But also, I think we probably need to work out how to help each other through forms of stress relief and uh, fun distraction, which don't add up to denial or delusion. It's uh, quite a tall order to find distraction that doesn't <laughs> add up to denial well, or destruction. Yeah, yeah. But I think if I'm always talking about this stuff with everyone all day, um, I already know that in my mo uh, so a, f a few of my important relationships have become dominated by this topic, and we've we've noticed that. And at the same time as bringing us closer, breaking open our hearts, um, we all realise that we don't want this to be the what our relationship. Um, is is only about mm. so so i'm still working on that one um 
And I've come to a realization that just because an awareness of collapse has brought me to a point where I'm going to stop working on what I used to work on, and at the moment I'm working on collapse and bringing people's attention to this and inviting people to drop the taboo and have creative generative dialogue about what do we do now, um, that doesn't mean I should stay working on that in future. Mm. You know, I can just integrate this and then maybe something else is true and real. Totally. I'm not a very good musician or painter or anything, but um, so I'm not quite sure what I'd end up doing. But I think, yeah, I don't want to just get stuck in the next 10 years of being the proverbial sandwich board man walking up and down digital streets saying the end of the world is nigh. It's <laughs> pretty depressing vision for myself. Hello, this is Amisha. We are just taking a little break from the conversation here. On behalf of myself and the team, I want to say thank you for being part of creating a beautiful future. We make this for you so that we will all have the vision, wisdom and activism we need at this time to weave a new narrative. Can you help us with this? You can do that by making a monthly donation to the podcast to cover our costs. Just the equivalent of a fair trade banana you might eat or a chai latte you might drink whilst you listen to this will make a huge difference to us. Head to www.thefutureisbeautiful.co forward slash community to become a monthly patron. And the other thing is to tell your friends about this podcast so they can tune in too. Send them a message or post on social media and let them know what you love about it. And whilst you're at it, leave us a review. And now, back to the conversation. Thank you for your loving beauty. As I've been sat here, I've felt everything that we've been talking about. I'm sure all of our friends listening can can feel the the energy and the emotion that is here in this space. And yet, perhaps because of my spirituality, I feel okay with everything you've just shared. I feel in a place where I can accept that this is what's happening and or what we perceive is happening because I also feel like there is this there's this space for a mystical component that we don't, don't understand or know and can't predict. And I don't even know what that is. And I don't even know if that means, if that is something that will support us or will <laughs> actually speed up destruction. I don't know. But I sense that there's more to this than, than the science. Yeah, um, the strange joy of climate change is the invitation to look right now at questions that we sideline in our busyness to be uh, respected, loved even. It is with me and other people I know, it's, it's making us really think about what is why are we alive and how do we wish to live and what's important to us? Um, so the grieving and the despair that comes uh, from a full uh, uh, looking at the latest trends head on, fully integrating it, the grief and despair can be transformative. Um, yeah, in some perspectives, it's almost like a, it's a very tough blessing in that it's a, uh, uh, it's a, uh, Many people don't think about this until later in life uh, or until they say get a terminal diagnosis or until someone they love deeply dies suddenly. And then those sorts of things get people to reflect deeper on the meaning of life. And, uh, and some people then reach out to certain religious or wisdom traditions. This is an invitation to do that. And that's really interesting because then do you want an, do you, in my case, I'm wondering, 
Is it the ego that wants to keep me involved in doing and keep me involved publicly in this stuff? Or is it a, a particular spiritual path, like an engaged spiritual mm. life? Because another part of me wants to disengage, learn more ways to return myself to a state of equanimity and bliss no matter what. But I still have a bit of a story around that being a bit selfish. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So there are, I mean, if you see the spiritual invitation of climate change, then there are many different ways of walking that spiritual path. Some people may choose to uh, become better at able helping people with trauma and panic and grief, and therefore sort of mitigating the emotional side of climate change. Other people will choose another path from a spiritual awakening because of this predicament. I'm often asked about now about, oh, Jem, this sounds hopeless and you've got no vision. Um, and I think what we're talking about now is, is where, for me, hope and vision lie, uh, are, um, which is a hope and vision of more people waking up to what's truly important in their life, yet not being attached to that in a way that makes them squabble with others you know it's sort of like waking up to what's important to you but also still holding it lightly not not needing to sort of die with a tight grasp on your worldview so uh, it's quite an abstract vision but it's of groups of people being curious kind joyful in supporting each other and learning from each other in a space that is constantly changing and uh, where reassuring stories are not the ones that uh, are going to help. It feels to me like it's a place of living with more freedom and I mean that in a sense of one of the things that I think about a lot which is a, a reason of where this show came from to have these conversations is how siloed the system makes us how it focuses us on like a identity and a path and a set of skills and that for me the richness of being human and the real permission to be human lies in actually being able to just do what is needed of you in whatever moment that you're in. And when we were talking yesterday with the teenagers, one of them, who was only 13, said, what are the skills that are most needed for Mm post-collapse? And what I found interesting about your answer was that it was like, I mean, it was like everything, you know, but it was all quite practical and also creative. It's like thinking, okay, how am I going to be able to fix this? (laughs) And how am I going to be able to build this? And what am I going to be able to bring to the group of people in front of me? You know, Mm -hmm. how can I bring some entertainment or some creativity. Hmm. Yeah, he was impressive, wasn't he? (laughs) Yes. Oscar, thank you for your question. There's a story around that, which is uh, many parents of young children I meet are very, they find it very difficult, this information, uh, because of the pain they then feel about their young children. And in the case of Oscar, we've seen how it was he who, through crying on a beach one day, uh, talking about that he won't grow up to live like his parents do, helped his parents because he was voicing something that they had felt but not really voiced. And it then meant that they sat down with him with my paper, Deep Adaptation, and read it together. And 
his response, I think, looks to have been very nourishing for them, to have helped them to think that they can bring this work to other children. I mean, they, 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 because Oscar has responded so... He's almost led his parents a bit emotionally in terms of saying this is something we can talk about. And, and Oscar then deciding to focus on this for his project at school about, so what does collapse mean for me in my life and what I should be doing, which is also what he was then asking, shows you that you know, there will be some grief, some tears, but then, okay, now what do we do? So it's not a time to be sorry, but a time to be yourself. Absolutely. And that's very much what I'm getting from chatting to those teenagers. And yeah, absolutely. But, but, well, the answer to his question is, well, pretty much um, nothing that what you're being taught in school. Uh, and so uh, climate strikes by school kids are spreading around the world where then they say, I'm not going to go to school because... I'm learning to be able to work hard in a future that won't exist, and so I'm going to protest outside government. I think there's another element that could be incorporated to future climate strikes by school kids, which is to say, we rebel against your curriculum, and we want to be involved in deciding together about what kind of skills we need to learn, and that can be all kinds of things, teamwork and mindfulness, but also practical skills like electrics and um, permaculture, horticulture, um, tying ropes, doing basic stuff, um, which we'll need to know more of if we just can't sort of like get everything shipped in from abroad. Yeah. So if you're in a child's mindset, it's super fun. I mean, it's creative quests and feet based approach to it you know let's build things let's do things let's become more capable so that was a big lesson for me yesterday that um there may be a moment of grieving but then the children there seem to move much really quite quickly into okay things are different what do we do now mm. absolutely we have to close mm-hmm I feel like it's perfect because we've landed on the opportunity. Hmm. The opportunity. Yeah, I'm in my life I'm more enthusiastic about engaging the young rather than nervous about what this means for them. Hmm. Yeah. I mean I believe that they know more than we do. Hmm. That they're more designed for these times than we are mm -hmm. if we listen to them mm -hmm. well thanks for the the download of <laughs> ideas it's good to be able to talk at these multiple levels of what this mm. this means thank you for putting this out there mm. and opening up you know, this exploration for us yeah i'm um fingers crossed <laughs> more and more people explore this in a spirit of love and curiosity rather than uh, panicked uh, approaches that are basically about fear and, and saving themselves. Yeah, That's the big challenge of our time is to make sure that when our hearts break we stay open and connected and curious rather than um, coming up with stories to justify ourselves being violent to others that we have othered more than those closer to us. Uh, so that's, that's for me, a, a, big, a big challenge, a big thing to be getting on with. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And your website for people to connect more to things that you've written and read the report is? Yeah, for this topic, it's deepadaptation.info. Great. And that links through to a category on my blog. Things Great. Like Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for spending your precious time with us. As always, you can find links to everything we mention in this episode, download our book, and discover so much more over on the blog. We don't believe in selling you things you don't need through this podcast, and so it's made possible with you, our community. If you loved this and would like to fund our show with a monthly donation or join our online group to connect with other listeners, 
please visit www.thefutureisbeautiful.co and click on community and support. Please also share with friends, hit subscribe and leave us a review so we can grow. Those gold stars really help others find us so these ideas can spread. Here is to us, creating a beautiful future together. The Future is Beautiful is made by an all-female team working voluntarily or on reduced rates until our listener support grows. If you have been moved by anything you heard here, please donate the equivalent of buying us a drink. All donations make a huge difference to us and will allow us to keep doing this and remain advertising free. Until next time, I leave you with this question. How will you create beauty in the world?